Okay, sir. So in three, two. Good afternoon. My name is Rod McMillian. I now call to order the November 15, 2022 meeting of the Audit Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at the discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's audit committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. As a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Jamison or Ms. Barr if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Jamison, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Dulesky. Here. Ms. Joes. Here. Ms. Hassan. Here. And Mr. McMillian. Here. Thank you. Thank you. A quorum being present, we will begin. Ms. Jameson, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Barr. Present. Ms. Stevens. Present. Ms. Nana. Present. Mr. Fletcher. Present. Mr. Street. Here. Ms. Sample. Here. Ms. Crew. Mr. Edwards. Here. Present. Okay, gotcha, Ms. Crew. Gotcha, Mr. Edwards. Mr. Hartlove. Here. Ms. Howie. Here. Mr. Augusto. Here. Ms. Carpenter. Here. Ms. Johnson. Here. Ms. Randall. Here. Ms. Anderson. Here. Mr. Fannin. Here. We also have two guests from Clifton Larson Allen, Mr. Early and Ms. Amos. Are there any other attendees present that I did not recognize? Hearing no additional names, I turn the meeting back to you, Mr. McMillian. Thank you, Ms. Jamison. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome our external auditors, Ms. Amos and Mr. Early. Additionally, if committee members have questions that are outside the scope of the reports presented this afternoon, please email Ms. Barr or myself with the questions. We will follow up with appropriate individuals to get the answers to your questions. The live video footage of our last meeting represents the minutes of the meeting. The minutes stand approved as recorded. Ms. Amos and Mr. Early, please proceed with the FY22 Annual Comprehensive Financial Report. Thank you. Um, this is uh, this is Pat Fannin, controller. Um, just as a brief intro, um, we're here to present our um, fiscal year 22 annual comprehensive financial report. The statements include our financial statements, our entity-wide statements, governmental statements, budgetary statements. They've been audited by Clifton Larson Allen, and um, Sherry uh, from Clifton Larson Allen is here today. I don't believe Bill is here. Correct, Sherry? Correct. Bill was okay. my. Um, my alter alternate if I could not be here. <laughs> okay. Um, and Sherry has some required communications with the uh, committee. Um, so I'll turn it over to Sherry to go over that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Pat. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to say good evening because right now I feel like it's very dark out, <laughs> even though it's probably more in the afternoon. And thank you for having me today. Um, as Pat had indicated, um, Clifton Larson Allen did audit the fiscal year 22 uh, annual comprehensive financial report. Um, just for uh, the committee's um, information, that report is the product of management. They're responsible for putting that report together and all the numbers that are represented um, in that report. Um, CLA's um, responsibility is to audit those numbers um to make sure there's no material misstatements and then also ensure that there are all the required disclosures and requirements are in there in accordance to accounting standards 
Um, the only thing that is is mine per se for CLA in your annual comprehensive financial report is the audit opinion. Um, and in that document, it starts on page 13. Um, and I am very pleased uh, this year to once again come to the committee um, with an unmodified audit opinion on the uh, financial report. Um, an unmodified opinion um, in layman's terms is a clean opinion or a good opinion. Um, it's the highest level of assurance that we can provide as your auditors on the financial information in that report. Um, I definitely um, advise the committee to kind of review our opinion. It is a couple pages long. Um, it was uh, revised some this year um, due to new auditing standards that um, we had to implement on our side, CLA side of the house. Um, so it does look a little bit differently, but it does provide a little bit more transparency on um, the responsibilities of management for the financial statements and then the responsibility for me as the auditor of the financial statements. So um, hopefully it'll be a little bit clearer and be good information um, for you to look at um, at your leisure. Um, I did want to um, inform the committee that we did have to implement um, one new uh, accounting standard this year um, was a rather large standard, uh, standard 87 related to leases. Um, and what this required was the board had to um, basically scrub all the lease agreements, um, MOUs or anything that would be contracts, anything of that sort um, to look for commitments um, to pay future amounts for assets that are currently being used, such as leases or buses or things of that nature. Um, so what that resulted in the board having to add an additional liability uh, for the uh, future payments of those leases on those leases, as well as a right to use asset on the financial statements as well, um, a capital asset, as you will, that offsets that liability um, for uh, financial reporting. So um, that was adopted as of July 1st, 2001, which is the beginning period of your financial statements. Um, and our opinion does have an emphasis of matter related to that implementation, but it does not affect our audit opinion. So um, I would say this was a very um, normal implementation of a pretty large accounting standard for us and both the board as well. Um, with that, with the, the nature of the accounting standard, um, I will have to report that unfortunately the audit was delayed um, and we did not meet the September 30th deadline to um, the Maryland State Department of Education. Um, the audit report was dated October 6th. Um, so a, a little bit late this year, um, but I say a lot of that had to do the extra work um, that revolved around implementing the standard. And to be very honest with you, um, Baltimore Schools is not the only school system in the state of Maryland that was late as well this year. So I think a lot of um, uh, school systems are feeling um, the compression of trying to close out their books at June 30th and prepare um, and have audited their financial statements in a three month turnaround, which is becoming harder and harder each year as we keep implementing more and more complex accounting standards, unfortunately. So. Um, as in prior years, we do have several accounting estimates in the financial statements. These are all routine as in prior years, um, which include the incurred but not reported claims for your self-insurance, as well as your um, liability for uh, pension and other post-employment benefits. Um, for all three of those estimates, we do um, rely on actuaries um, that provide um, information to the board on those estimates. Uh, we do look at the assumptions and factors used by the actuaries for reasonableness um, compared to prior years, compared to other similar jurisdictions as yourselves, as well as, as, well as um, ensure they're in accordance with um, government auditing standards as well. Um, there were no uncorrected misstatements or corrected misstatements in the financial statements. Um, and management did um, provide certain representations um, to CLA um, and a copy of that is in your is in your packet. Um, those representations basically indicate that the board has provided um, all the information requested and everything is accurate and true to the best of their knowledge. Um, and then we did not have any significant disagreements with management either um, as throughout the audit or in regards to the implementation of the new standard as well. 
Um, I am pleased to report that we did not um, have any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in internal control this year related uh, to the financial audit. Um, so that is that is wonderful news and a good testament to the internal control system um, of, of finance um, and surrounding departments that feed into the financial statements as well. Um, we did have a couple of management letter comments I will quickly go over with you. Um, the first one is related to the other post employment benefit liability. Um, as I previously said, that liability is an actuarial calculation, um, but management does provide certain information, which we call the census data, to the actuary on a routine basis. Um, this information uh, for the census data has all the employees um, that, that are active or retirees um, and certain uh, demographic information about those retirees and active employees. Um, the actuary did note that there were some inaccuracies in that um, data. Um, for the active employees, if the hire dates were before July 1st, 2000, the the report defaulted that their hire date was was July 1st, 2000. So um, for any employee that was hired before July 1, 2000, it was basically saying that the um, the report did say that they were hired July 1st, 2000, versus if they were hired, you know, um, February 2nd, 1982. Um, there were some duplicate employees, um, and some of the information was missing which pension plan um, they were enrolled in, whether it was a state plan or the county plan. Um, and as far as retiree information, there was some subsidiary percentage healthcare plans and coverage information that was missing as well. Um, the actuary did note this in their report um, and did make certain concessions and assumptions um, related to that, especially using some prior data they received in prior years um, on those um, those employees where the higher dates were incorrect. Um, most likely they had a, another spreadsheet from years, uh, you know, a couple years ago that they could fall back on to um, to be able to determine what higher dates should be. Um, and all of this um, was the result of the cyber attack um, and trying to get the inf accurate information to the actuary was a little bit challenging due to the timing of the information needed to be um, provided to the actuary of November 1st, 2021, which is right when the cyber attack occurred. So. Um, the other comments that we had were IT related and they're pretty much carry over from prior year. Um, the first one is um, we did note um, a couple terminated users that their access was not removed from the system um, timely. So we just recommend um, that as soon as employees terminated from the board that the, all, all of their access across all systems is terminated immediately. Um, so that way um, there is no um, uh, that the access isn't being open and, and could potentially be a risk down the road. Um, we also noted that there has not been a formal risk assessment in the last five years. Um, we do recommend that um, IT um, perform a risk assessment. We've given in our management letter um, some things to, to um, consider including in that risk assessment, such as a comprehensive list of IT assets and the risk associated with those assets, to name a couple. Um, and then we also noted that um, the disaster recovery plan and business continuity plan has not been fully updated um, to take into account all the changes in the current environment, the IT environment as a result of the cyber attack. Um, obviously, the IT environment is still changing. Um, and so I'm sure that's probably that's why it has not been fully updated at this point. Um, but we do recommend that once the I, the environment starts to settle down a little bit from the cyber attack, that those documents do get updated accordingly. Um, so. Um, and that's all I had to present today to the committee. Um, as always, we're very grateful for the time um, that all stakeholders um, in the audit um, provide to CLA, whether it be the finance department. We also, like I said, work with IT. We work with procurement, work with HR, payroll, all, all the different um, business areas um, help provide data and information that we use for the audit. And we're very grateful for the time that they provide us and getting us things timely to um, get the audit completed. So very much appreciated. Thank you, Ms. Amos. Committee members, any discussion on this report? Any discussion?
Mr. McMillian. Yes, please, Ms. Please. Jones. Yes, hi. So thank you for this presentation. Uh, you will be presenting this at the board meeting on the next board meeting as well. Yes, we're on the agenda coming. for the next board meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so it's good to hear that we had no material deficiencies. Um, one of the things that popped up at me is that the board has not conducted a formal risk assessment since 2017. Um, who normally conducts it? I know Ms. Barr has talked about doing a ris risk assessment and how often in your professional opinion should a large system like BCPS conduct one? Um, so when it comes to the risk assessment, we're focused more on the IT um, area versus um, which would be separate probably from uh, Ms. Barr and internal audit. Um, so we're, we're recommending a formal risk assessment of that IT environment, the information technology environment. So um, and, and I would say that should be revisited annually. It doesn't mean there has to be significant changes annually, but you should kind of review it once you have it updated annually just to you know tweak it for any changes that might come um, uh, come about throughout the year. Thank you. So this question may actually not be for you. It might be for IT. Um, do we have a formal asset management of all of our inventory of all of our IT hardware, software um, devices? Who maintains it and what software are you using to to contain an inventory of that? Yeah, Ms. Joes, I can speak to that. So we do um, and what we're doing right now. So. Um, we actually have this stored in two separate systems. The desktop computing systems, uh, we capture all of our asset inventory for all of the computing equipment through Destiny. That's our tool to be able to um, pull out and discover um, devices that are on, a, on our network. And then that is stored in our configuration management database in Sharewell. The server inventory is stored in a separate platform. We're currently in the process of consolidating all of the assets into one um, and then be able to tie that so we can follow true IT service management, um, the, the framework and best practices to be able to uh, take incidents that may come in against and relate them to assets. So um, yes, we do have the inventory captured. Um, we're moving forward with consolidating that into the Sharewell system. Okay, thank you. And do you also maintain mobile devices in your inventory, For, Mr. Pedro? Uh, mobile devices that are um, government, or sorry, government, uh, BCP, BCPS owned. Um, and um, as you know, we're on a BYOD environment here. So um, we don't manage those devices. OK, thank you. Committee members, any other discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Amos, thank you very much for your report. And we're going to move on. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Jamison, please proceed with the FY22 records management audit report. OK, good evening. I am going to share the records management audit that was issued in August of 2022. The purpose of the audit was to assess the status of the records management process in BCPS. This report was posted on board docs for your review and is available on the BCPS website. There will be no PowerPoint associated with my presentation tonight. First, some history about the motions that were passed by the Board of Education related to the destruction of records by BCPS employees. There were three different motions passed between August of 2018 and January of 2019. The first one was a ban on all records destruction. The second was a modification so that the ban only applied to staff members at the level of executive director or above. The third one, which is still in effect right now, was another modification that made the ban apply only to the BOE, superintendent, business services, ethics review panel, and the division of HR. In July of 2019, BCPS contracted with iMerge Consulting to provide an assessment of BCPS records management practices and training that were developed by the Office of Law, who were the system liaisons for records management at the time. This was due to the events related to the UHY audit, issues with financial disclosure forms, and complaints and media stories about unauthorized document destruction in BCPS. 
In July of 2022, the Records Management Program transitioned from the Office of Law to the Department of Information Technology. So that's it for the history. Now let's move on into the summary of results of the Records Management Audit. First, we noted that the Office of Law started several initiatives to improve the records management process, including updating all retention schedules, designating records liaisons at each school or site, developing a training program for records liaisons, which is now part of the onboarding process for all new hires, creating a comprehensive records management website page with tons of information for BCPS staff and the public to view, and finally, all BCPS staff are now required to take annual records management training. Next in our audit, we tested retention schedules. We found that all retention schedules were completed by BCPS and approved by the Maryland State Archivist. Then we reviewed certificates of destruction or cord forms. These are the official documents that are completed whenever destruction of official records is requested in BCPS. We reviewed a random sample of 172 cord forms and determined that all but one was properly approved. The one that was not, it was due to an oversight by the school not using the correct form and it was subsequently corrected and properly approved. Now let's talk about the transition of the records management processes to the Department of Information Technology. The DOIT and the law office worked collaboratively together to transition the program. DOIT staff reviewed the iMERGE report and hired a records management officer as recommended in the report. DOIT will implement additional feasible recommendations from the report and focus on electronic records that have retention schedules that are actually embedded in the documents themselves. That leads us to the risks that we identified that are associated with the ongoing BOE records destruction ban that we talked about in the very beginning. First, there is a lack of storage space. At the time the audit was completed, the warehouse was at 96% capacity. It is difficult to locate records that are spread across various warehouse locations. This leads to a loss of time and resources due to the time it takes to identify and locate records. Security is also an issue. If data is not safe and secure, more money will need to be spent on shredding and deleting files that are no longer needed or used. Failure to produce the records in a timely manner can lead to non-compliance with PIA requests. There are also high storage costs associated with the ban. And there are concerns with accidental deletions of electronic files, possible confidentiality breaches, and possible compromised accountability. Therefore, we offered these recommendations to improve the BCPS records management process. First, we recommend to lift the records destruction ban to avoid the risks that we just discussed associated with it. We also recommend to continue to follow the approved records retention schedules and continue to implement the feasible iMERGE report recommendations. The floor is now open for comment by staff or questions from committee members. Thank you. Committee members, any discussion? Anybody? I'm looking for my my chat. Miss Joes, please. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Um, so thank you for this presentation, Ms. Jamison. Um, it was pretty comprehensive. My concern is uh, when you said that because of the record retention, we're actually opening ourselves up to potential uh, risks uh, and uh, that is a that that definitely is a concern. Um, just seeing that we have a blanket ban on all records. So thank you for the presentation, and hopefully, uh, you know, the board takes action on this. You're welcome. Thank you, Miss Jameson. I have a question about under the recommendations. Follow the approved records retention schedule. Can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Who who establishes that approved schedule? So that is that was done by the Office of Law in connection with all the various offices within BCPS. They then got the approved retention uh, the re retention schedules approved by the Maryland State Archivist, and they are all listed on our website in the records management section, so that anyone can refer to them, and they are at a you know at your fingertips 
availability if anyone has questions about how long to keep something for everything that we have in the system by department is out there and has been reviewed and approved by the Maryland State Archivist. OK, thank you very much. Committee members, any additional questions or comments? Seeing none, let me check my chat real quick. OK, seeing none. I'm going to do I have a motion to approve the recommendations to immediately lift the records destruction ban noted in the report. So move Stolowski. Thank you. Do I have a second? Wait, let me see. May I have a second, please? Second. Miss Joe seconded. Any discussion? Miss Jameson, please take a roll call vote. Miss Stolowski? Yes. Miss Joes? Yes. Miss Hassan? Yes. And Mr. McMillian? Yes. The Thank motion. you for in, in favor. Thank you very much. The motion passes and the recommendation will be forwarded to the full board for its consideration. Ms. Jamison, thank you very much. Mr. Edwards, please proceed with the FY22 manual payroll audit report. Hi, Mr. McMillian, this is Mr. Fletcher. I am going to cover that for us. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, so our report for the manual payroll audit was issued on November 4th and has been supplied via board docs and is also on our website. Due to the cyber attack, manual processes were implemented to identify, calculate, and approve pay for all employees. And although the manual process is sufficient to continue payroll operations, it presents an increased risk to BCPS for errors and fraud. It was determined that certain manual payrolls, primarily processed in the summer, will continue to be processed uh, manually. And so the objective of this audit was to determine the controls over and the accuracy of manually payroll, uh, I'm sorry, manually processed payrolls. And so part, as part of our review, uh, we took a look at several factors related to uh, manually processed payrolls, um, took a sample of the manually processed payrolls, make sure they were accurate and appropriately approved, took a look at overall internal controls surrounding manually processed payrolls, and then took a look at canceled checks and exception reporting. Now, when we took a look, and I'm gonna kind of work backwards there, when we took a look at canceled checks, what we found is that canceled checks were supported by appropriate documentation, such as emails um, and canceled check reporting from the bank, and where applicable, the physical deface canceled check was still there. So the, what we saw was the adequate support for that canceled check. And then when we took a look at the exception reporting, we found that payroll managers review exception reports that are generated for them on a biweekly basis. And these reports identify potential issues such as employees with mismatch, mismatched union dues, uh, employees with high gross pay, employees paid that are under interim status, uh, and gross or net pay under $15. So those that would pop out as true exceptions. And we tested both of those with, with no issues. When we took a look at, or we took a sample of manual payroll, uh, manually processed payroll payments, we did find uh, two issues. One was related to uh, manually payroll, manual payroll payments were not accurate. And so three out of our sample of 61 um, were found to be inaccurate. Uh, two employees received, uh, I apologize, two employees received overpayments and one employee received an underpayment. And so presented this information to the Office of Payroll. Um, they were able to provide overpayment letters to the employees and um, the employees have already paid back those overpayments. And the employee that we actually underpaid has also, uh, that information has already been processed and that uh, employee has been made whole. Then on the approval side, what we found is that manual payroll payments were not always supported by an approved time record. And so five of those 61 um, manual payroll processes, our manual payroll payments were not supported by the approved time record. Um, so what we didn't see was 
some sort of approval uh, from um, management personnel to say yes, this is appropriate to pay. And then when we took a look at overall internal controls, uh, internal controls should be in place to adequately process, adequately address risk that would prevent the completion of the specified process or objective. And what we found is that the Office of Payroll lacked documented standards uh, or SOPs uh, for processing the manual payrolls. And then there also wasn't a formal list of payroll approvers, and we did not find a report that would identify payments to duplicate uh, direct deposit accounts. And so we worked with um, the Office of Payroll Management and, and that team to um, come up with an approach uh, for the corrective action. Um, and I will turn at this point, I will kind of turn it over to Mr. Hartlove to see if there's anything in addition that you would like to add into that. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Fletcher. Um, certainly, uh, we you know we welcome the internal audit in. Um, we know we have a, a manual process right now as a result of the um, uh, cyber attack, and uh, we have uh, uh, certainly um, we would much rather these uh, uh, many of these these uh, these uh, processes be automated. We're working on that. We have two projects going on right now. The main one is the implementation of uh, Kronos, uh, which is a, a, a time and attendance system. Um, and so, so we, our, our uh, focus has been to uh, get that up and running. Um, and that will, uh, once it's fully implemented, will uh, put us back into a much more automated uh, 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 payroll process, but in the interim, we do have this module, uh, this uh, manual uh, process that we, these manual processes that we that we have, and we are certainly interested in trying to make them uh, put have as many internal uh, controls in place as possible to make um, th them run as smoothly as possible. So, uh, certainly, uh, we uh, we appreciate the uh, the the audit. Uh, the items that were brought to our attention and we've uh, responded and uh, we are going to make the um, recommend try to make as many of the recommended changes um, as we can. Um, there are some members of the payroll team here uh, for any any questions. Certainly I can answer questions or we can um, answer any specific questions you have related to to the audit. Committee members, any discussion on this topic? Any discussion? Mr. Hartlove, I have a question about the. So you said the Cronus, Cronus, it's K R O N I S. It, and actually, that's the old name. It it now I think is called UKG Ready, but it's it, the old name used to be Cronos. Uh, that's yes. It's now, a time and it, it's a time and attendance system. Yes, for the hourly workers. Yes. Correct? For all, ultimately, the goal is to have everyone on Kronos, including the teachers. And yeah, anyone who has, you know, if you're a, um, if you're an, ex if you're an exception employee, like, um, you know, like a teacher, you would use it for your leave, you know, recording your leave. Um, uh, for for hourly employees, you'd re use it for recording your time. But all employees would be interacting with the time and attendance system, um, um, in some manner upon full uh, implementation. And I think next week we, uh, you know, it's the second, believe it or not, anniversary of the ransomware attack. How long do you project that you're going to continue doing this manually before you get it up and running completely automatic or? Uh, Complete, um, I- Automation. We, we're looking at the beginning of the phase in this uh, late winter, early spring. Um, to fully implement, we're looking at probably a year, maybe two years to fully implement all phases of it. Because, you know, so it, 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 some of the later phases become uh, become a little bit challenging. So, uh, but we're, we're hoping to get a bulk of our people on here, you know, within a year. And until that happens, it's still, it's going to be input manually. 
Yes, and that's yeah, that's yeah, we have the the paper that we have now and and uh, you know, I think we have a good process for what it is for a paper process. Um, I, you know, we I, I think our folks do a phenomenal job, uh, but paper is certainly um, has its drawbacks. OK, Mr. Hartloff, thank you very much. Committee members, any additional questions or comments? Hearing none, I'm going to thank Mr. Fletcher and Mr. Excuse me, I see Ms. Stoluski question. No, no thanks. OK, Mr. Hartloff, thank you. Mr. Fletcher, thank you very much. We're going to move on under new business. Mr. Fletcher, please proceed with the FY23 investigations. Update, please. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go ahead and cover and actually I want to share. Pull this up and share it with you. The October 2022 uh, investigative unit report. Apologize. There we go. OK. So you should see our report now. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. So this is our report for the month of October. Um, we received 11 new cases in through our hotline during the month. Uh, five were kept for an investigation by internal audit and six were actually outside of the purview of internal audit and they will actually be memoed to file uh, after they're referred out to the appropriate individuals in management. So as we slide into table two, we, we take a look at where we were in the beginning of the month. So in the beginning of the month, we actually had five internal audit investigations, one management investigation, and then five memo to file. So we had 11 cases open as of September 30th. And then once you factor in the 11 new cases, actually put us at 22 cases that were open at some point during the month of October. Um, and so you can see we had nine total internal audit investigations, one management investigation, and then 12 that were outside the purview that could be closed with memo to file. And the bottom part of this table talks about what we were able to close during the month of October. And so we did close one uh, internal audit investigation. As you can see, that was unsubstantiated. We also unsubstantiated one of the management investigations. Uh, and then we were able to, to complete and close 10 of the memo to files. So throughout the month, we closed 12 of the 22 cases that were open, which left us with 10 total. So eight, as of October 31st, eight remaining internal audit investigations, no management investigations, management referrals, and then two memo to file. Uh, that is the what makes up the 10 that were open as of October 30th. And then, uh, as you scroll through this report, table three is going to have detail on all of our internal audit investigations uh, that were open and closed throughout the month. Table four will have all the detail of the management investigations, and then table five is going to have everything for our memo of the file. So I believe you, and, and as you're familiar, put the what's been closed recently up top, and then everything that's open um, right below that. And so I believe everyone's familiar with these reports. Um, and this has already been shared with you, I do believe. So this is already out there. Uh, if you have any specific questions, we are more than willing to help out. Mr. McMillian, Committee members, back any you questions? for any questions. Thank, thank you, Mr. Fletcher. Committee members, any questions? I don't see. Uh, Mr. Fletcher, I have a question. Yes, sir. Once something's closed, uh, you know, at some point in time, if, if you know, somehow you gathered other information or additional information, what happens? Can you go back and open that up again? Or is it once it's closed, it's closed? What's certainly, the time frame certainly. There? And, and so typically the way something like that would happen uh, would be if, if an allegation were to come back in through a hotline a second time uh, or a third time or multiple times uh, and 
it gave us additional information that we may not have known before or may not have found before, um, or gave us a little bit more specificity that we could could now look into something uh, a little more direct. And so if that's the case, we can certainly um, go back into that whether or not we reopen a, a closed case or just use that new information and, and open that as a new case, uh, that would probably be the, the more likely route. And what we would do as part of that new case is, and really any case that comes in, we always look historically to see if any uh, similar or identical allegations have come in like that before. Uh, and we will make reference to that. So we will know what we've looked at and tested before. So it's not uh, necessarily just a brand new jump in. Here's the start of an investigation. We're going to start with let's find what we've done in the past and, and take that and work forward. Mr. Fletcher, thank you very much for answering my questions. Absolutely. Committee, committee members, any additional questions? Seeing none on the chat and hearing none, Mr. Fletcher, thank you very much. Mr. Lusky, I see your face. Any questions? No. OK. OK, we're going to move on. Announcements. The next meeting of the Audit Committee will be on Tuesday, January 17, 2022 at 4.30 p.m. Uh, I'm not going to see anybody before the new year or on this meeting anyway, so I hope everybody has a good holiday season and thank all of our presenters for presenting. Thank you very much for attending. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye, Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you.